Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This afternoon, we'll be hearing from Dr. Marek Hodakiewicz. Dr. Hodakiewicz holds the Kosciuszko Chair in Polish Studies at the Institute of World Politics and leads IWP's Center for Intermarium Studies. At IWP, he also serves as a professor of history and teaches courses on geography and strategy, contemporary politics and diplomacy, Russian politics and foreign policy, and mass murder prevention and failed and failing states. He's the author of Intermarium, The Land Between the Black and Baltic Seas, and numerous other books and articles. He holds a PhD from Columbia University and has previously taught at the University of Virginia and Loyola Marymount University. Dr. Hodakiewicz, welcome. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, as always. We appreciate it. Uh, it's business as usual here at the Institute of World Politics. And I shall continue with our tale of the Intermarium during the First World War and its aftermath. First, as always, a few quotes. Michal K. Pavlikovsky, who was an eyewitness and landed nobleman, uh, wrote in his memoirs that the watershed years, for instance, the year 1905, 1917, or 19. 19 proved at Oculos what thin veneer of Russianness of Minsk there existed. Anytime Minsk underwent a sort of uh, an earthquake of freedom, each time then Polishness would blow up, reveal itself in a completely spontaneous way. The Polish speech reverberated through the streets, Polish newspapers appeared, and at the theater and at the soapbox, there were Polish words spoken. This is on after over a hundred years of uh, Moscovite occupation of Minsk. And here is a uh, quote from Arthur Lord Balfour, the Foreign Secretary of Great Britain in March 22nd, 1917. He wrote, the Poland of the future is now, as it has ever been since the great crime of partition was accomplished, the greatest crux of European diplomacy. Even a kinder quote I will provide from Colonel Edward House, a confidant of President Wilson, who averred on April 28th, 1917, that I warmly advocated a restored and a rejuvenated Poland, a Poland big enough and powerful enough to serve as a buffer state between Germany and Russia. And we go on to people who were less inclined towards the cause of Poland, namely Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. This is May 12th, 1917. Owning to the long oppression by Russia, Poland's policy is a wholly nationalist one, and the whole Polish nation is obsessed with one idea, revenge on the Moscovites. No one has oppressed the Poles more than the Russian people who served in the hands of the Tsars as the executioner of Polish freedom. In no nation does hatred of Russia sit so deep as with the Poles. No nation dislikes Russia so intensely as the Poles. As a result, we have a strange thing 
because of the Polish bourgeoisie, Poland has become an obstacle to the socialist movement. The whole world could go to the devil so long as Poland was free. Of course, this way of putting the question is a mockery of internationalism. Of course, Poland is now a victim of violence, but for the Pol uh, Polish nationalists to count on Russia liberating Poland, that would be to the international. The Polish nationalists have so imbued uh, the Polish people with their view that this is how the situation is regarded in Poland. And a, a, a jump from David Lloyd George. Russia can only be saved by her own people, we believe. Uh, we believe, however, that an independent Poland comprising all those genuinely Polish elements who desire to form part of it is an urgent necessity for the stability of Western Europe. And next we have the 13 points or point number 13 of pre U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, January 8th, 1918, 13. An independent Polish state should be erected, which should include the territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations, which should be assured a free and secure access to the sea and whose political and economic independence and in territorial integrity should be guaranteed by international covenant. And here is a tidbit from <clears throat> Leo Trotsky. The historic hour has struck. The time is coming when our brothers in Lithuania, in Poland, and in the Ukraine as well, I hope in Finland, will be united under the banner of the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic. This is, this was uh, 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 published in Pravda on October 22nd, 1918, but Trotsky spoke at a rally at St. Petersburg on uh, October 19th, 1918. Professor Viktor Sukhenitsky wrote as follows. The position of the Poles who are natives of the former Grand Duchy of Lithuania was rather difficult. They preferred to preserve historic Lithuania undivided and united with the crown, that is the kingdom of Poland, but in practice they faced a dilemma, either a division of the Grand Duchy or complete separation from Poland. Many of them were inclined to choose the former as a lesser evil. Their Polish patriotism prevailed. Incidentally, Professor Sukhenitsky was a participant in the events and he was talking about himself. This was his choice. A German historian, Jochen Böhler, wrote that the outcome of the Great War was influenced by the Russian Revolution in the East and by the American invasion in the West. In this light, independence of Poland in 1918 was not the logical end of a predictable chain reaction activated by certain action. It was the result of highly improbable circumstances which were created by the turmoil of war and revolution. I beg to differ with Bühler. This was the American liberation of Europe from Germany. Unfortunately, we didn't take Berlin, so we had to return 20 years later. It was not an American invasion. And here is the incredible and wonderful Richard Pipes. The white armies did indeed execute many Bolsheviks and Bolshevik sympathizers, usually in summary fashion, sometimes in a barbarous manner, but they never elevated terror to the status of a policy and never created a formal institution like the Cheka, the secret police, to carry it out. Their executions were as a rule ordered by field officers acting on their own initiative, often in an emotional reaction to the sights which greeted their eyes when they entered areas evacuated by the Red Army. <clears throat> 
odious as it was, the terror of the white armies was never systematic, as was the case with the Red Terror. And here is a lovely quote from the first Bolshevik commander-in-chief of the Red Army, Ensign Nikolai Vikrylenko, regarding Red Terror, 1918-1921. We must execute not only the guilty, execution of the innocent will impress the masses even more. And here is a uh, Red Army Colonel Mikhail Muraviev's decree order before the capture of the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, in, no, in February 1918. Pitilessly destroy all officers and cadets, Haidamax, rebellious Cossacks, monarchists and all enemies of the revolution in Kiev. Then we have the recollections of cavalry captain Viktor Dzierżykraj Stokalski, who fought in the Polish self-defense forces in the Ukraine. This is what he had to say about 1917 and 1918. The mob smelled blood and absolute impunity of robberies. Manor houses emptied. Everyone escaped to the little town seeking shelter and saving his life. Old nests of the landed nobility fell prey to rampaging peasantry, which destroyed more or less everything. This was not the military, but simply retreating bands without officers marching through villages. They radicalized the peasants, called them for rebellion and admonish them to rob and destroy the manor and the domesna. And here is an opinion of, an, of another eyewitness, a Lithuanian Catholic priest, Antanas Pauliukas, about Lithuania's first independent leftist uh, folk nationalist government, our new Lithuanian government does not differ that much from the Bolsheviks. At the end of World War I and its, in its aftermath, in the western part of the borderlands, the Poles enjoyed a temporary advantage over everyone, except initially the Germans. The Poles were simply the best organized group at the grassroots. Their strategic aim was to restore the old Commonwealth. However, both the Germans and the Bolsheviks did everything they could to halt the process, to destroy. When they were unable to dominate on their own, the occupiers mobilized local folk nationalisms against the Poles. In the eastern territories of the so-called taken lands, Ziemia Zabrane, the situation was very fluid. Already in January 1918, there emerged the foundations of an independent Polish state in Bobruysk and its neighborhood, 
where the Polish first corps settled under General Dovbor Mosiński. It consisted mostly of Poles who earlier had served in the armies of the Tsar. Mosiński and his soldiers beat the Bolsheviks, set up a Polish administration and a Polish armed force, which controlled a large chunk of the lands of the first partition. They restored law and order. Unfortunately, after a few months, this particular experiment, the disarming of the Polish troops and the interning of uh, the whole corps, which was followed by the transfer of the soldiers and officers, unarmed soldiers and officers, of course, to occupied central and western Poland. This uh, nucleus of the Polish army failed to save itself, even though it subordinated the whole body pro forma to the ruling Regency Council in Warsaw. The Germans were not going to put up with any competition, especially not any independent armed force uh, on the front. Only in November 1918, the Polish Republic officially proclaimed its independence. Immediately, it's said to organize, it's set out to organize its armed forces. Between 1918 and 1922, the Poles fought in nine wars in the center of their state and on all the borderlands. Their enemies were Germans, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Czechs, and Bolsheviks. From time to time, the Poles also fought against the whites, the blacks, and the Greens, because various Polish units had to slash their way home through the territories in the grips of the revolutionary orgy in the former Russian Empire. They also had to extinguish the flame of anarchy in the borderlands of the forming state. By the force of inertia, the war broke out also in the eastern borderlands. The inheritors of the old Commonwealth wanted to restore it as a matter of course. Warsaw sent help after the local Poles liberated Vilna and Lvov and called for the union of their little motherlands with the Commonwealth. Both cities were inhabited, inhabited mainly by the Poles and Jews constituted the largest minority. In Vilna itself, the Lithuanian minority was virtually non-existence according to the German population tally of 1916. In Vilna land, the Lithuanians constituted a very small percent of the village population. The Poles dominated in the environs of Vilna. The Ukrainians in Lviv were a minority and the Poles the majority. However, outside of the city, in the Lviv provinces, the Ukrainians dominated unequivocally. But the Ukrainians, the Lithuanians and others failed to translate their numeric superiority into a nationalist victory as far as majority of localities were mixed ethnic, where ethnically mixed population resided. Moreover, out of all nationalities, the Poles were also the most nationally conscious. 
the bulk of the population in the borderlands possessed an Orthodox Christian and local mentality. Perhaps it can be referred to as Ruthenian. One could argue that even among um, the Polish Catholic people, the average level of national consciousness was higher than among other ethnicities with an exception, perhaps an exception of the Jewish people. This concern, not only uh, central and western Poland, but also the borderlands in the east. As a result of such factors, the Poles succeeded in establishing their government and administration in the belt of the western slice of the intermarium between Vilno and Lvov, as well as in garrison cities based on railroad junctions. In the provinces between those cities, there rampaged an unstoppable, seemingly unstoppable revolution and guerrilla struggle. In the entire territory of the Intermarium, the local peasant population formed its green self-defense forces. Their aim was to protect their own villages and to prevent the land which they had grabbed from uh, uh, landed nobles to be taken away from them, as well as to save the harvest and whatever items were robbed by the peasants from anybody, including nobility. The Greens scored a particular success in White Ruthenia. They controlled entire areas. In this place, they also uh, allied themselves with the forces of, usually with the forces of populist Belarusian nationalism, which proclaimed the foundation of its fleeting state with the capital in Minsk in March 1918. So-called Belarusian People's Republic was crushed by the Bolsheviks in 1919 as soon as the Germans retreated. Uh, some of the units of the Green Oak continued their struggle against the Reds until 1921. Later, the remnants trickled uh, back west to find their asylum in Poland. Actively, uh, uh, active mainly in the eastern and southern part of the Ukraine, the blocks established their, their, uh, their anarchistic outposts. They were more akin to the ancient Cossack siege rather uh, than to uh, uh, utopian communes of the Bakuninian ideology. The blocks rampaged against any and all forces of order. First, Nestor Makhno and his adherents allied themselves with the Reds against the Whites, then they broke with the communists. The Bolsheviks destroyed them completely in 1920. A similar fate befell Eastern Ukrainian populist nationalists who ruled briefly in Kiev. They proclaimed their independence in 1918 and fought against the Reds, Whites, and Blacks in Central and Eastern U uh, Ukraine. Uh, in the West in Galicia, there emerged a separate nationalist Ukrainian government, which mainly acted against the Poles, but also against Romanians, Hungarians, and even Czechoslovaks, 
until it was defeated by Poland in 1919. A year later, Eastern Ukrainian populist nationalists under Simon or Simon Petlura joined the Poles and together with them went to war against the, war, the Bolsheviks. Following the defeat of the communists, Warsaw agreed to a compromise peace in Moscow and got rid of its um, provisional Ukrainian confederates uh, who, by the way, failed to gain any traction among the Ukrainian masses. Meanwhile, Poland also prag pragmatically maintained its, maintained its neutrality as far as the Russian monarchists and other anti-Bolsheviks. In a predictable way, this assisted the Reds, unfortunately, to destroy the Whites in the south and north of the Intermarium. In the north, there emerged a um, chain of ephemeral alliances, thanks to which the Baltic people staunchly defended their newly achieved independence. Um, Estonia and Lithuania proclaimed their freedom with uh, agreement of Germany in February 1918, but Latvia only in November 1918 because the Germans had planned to dominate that country directly. The Lithuanians of the Kovno area, without much success, collaborated with the Bolsheviks against the Poles in the conflict over Vilna, which was a, which was the historical um, capital of Lithuania. Their anti-Polish offensive in the Suwalki area failed miserably as well. On the other hand, as um, Thomas Balkeli stresses, the Lithuanians suffered of mass desertion, including mass desertion to the Red Army. And because of this, or rather despite of this, they managed to survive the Bolshevik offensive between January and March 1919. But the main credit for it goes to the German Freikorps, German mercenaries, freebooters. They took on themselves the brunt of all the fighting. According to Val Kelly's, a resilience inspired both the fledgling Lithuanian troops that joined the action only in February and the local population who learned that the Bolsheviks could be stopped after all. Remarkably, the Freikorps military role is barely recognized in contemporary Lithuanian accounts of the conflict, which is common, commonly commemorated as a war of independence. But it was the Germans who did most of the fighting at this stage. All this notwithstanding, in 1923, in the last wave of violence, the Lithuanians grabbed the Glypeda uh, Memelland region from Germany. Meanwhile, Latvia and Estonia fought against the Bolsheviks with increasing zeal. They also fought the Germans and the Whites. In the beginning of 1919, the Lithuanians suffered a defeat first by the communists, chiefly their own communists, ethnic Lithuanians, and then the Germans. The former established a Soviet Lithuania and the latter proclaimed the, the Baltic Duchy. That state was supposed to have spanned the area from northern to western Latvia, 
as well as a part of Estonia. Therefore, the Estonians sent assistance to the Latvians first against the Germans. Meanwhile, the Poles, the, 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 the Latvians allied themselves further with the Poles against the Bolsheviks. Uh, the defeat of the Reds at the hands of the Polish-Latvian coalition took place to a certain degree because of the assistance of the German side in 1920. At the same time, the Estonians defeated the Reds because of the assistance of the Whites, the British, the Finns, and the Swedes. The Baltic nations secured arms in hand, a fragile independence, but this would not have been possible without the Polish victory over the Red Army in August and September 1920. In this manner, and under such conditions, Western and Northern parts of the Intermarium emerged free and independent from the slaughterhouse of the First World War, Revolution, and Civil War. At that time, each nation state concentrated on its own narrowly defined interests. Most of the nation states quarreled violently with their neighbors. All of them fought the Bolsheviks. However, despite their anti-communism, each was eager to find a separate modus vivendi with the Soviets. That egoism translated into a horrible outcome to the interest of the solidarity of other nations of the intermarium. Already in the fall of 1919, the Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians undertook efforts to coordinate negotiations with the Bolsheviks. Because of the Lithuanian conflict with Poland about Vilno, Tallinn and Riga decided to sign separate treaties with Moscow. The Estonians signed their peace agreement already on uh, February 2nd, 1920, and the Latvians on August 11th. By signing their treaty with Estonia and Latvia, the Bolsheviks also managed to forestall any attempt by Poland to build a broad anti-Bolshevik Estonian-Latvian Finnish alliance in mid-March 1920. By this time, none of Poland's potential allies were willing to continue their military conflicts with Soviet Russia. In this manner, national Egoism undermined the unity of the region. Pragmatic abandon, the pragmatic abandonment of free Ukraine by the Poles demonstrates this matter cl clearly. Let us also remember that everywhere except in Poland, folk nationalisms were carrying out not only a national revolution for independence, but also a social revolution against alien elites. This concerned mostly uh, the nobility, which stemmed from historic nations and usually opposing folk ethno-nationalism which the nobles considered non-historic. It was at the cost of the landed nobility that folk nationalists of the successor states of the Tsarist nation 
promised to reward their peasant soldiers and their families. This was the most important trump card to achieve popularity by the folk nationalists. In practice, that meant that leftist Ukrainian nationalism, nationalists, as well as much less influential Belarusian nationalists, promised their followers the division of Russian, Polish, Jewish, and other landed estates whose owners were considered foreigners. The rapacity of the Lithuanians was concentrated mainly on Polish landed estates, but also uh, Russian uh, estates. And the expro expropriationist uh, drive of the Latvians and uh, Lithuanians were aimed mainly uh, against the Baltic Germans. Although the great Russian landed properties was also confiscated. The conservatives, including Polish conservatives, viewed this as a, as a particular kind of national Bolshevism. According to a neo-Marxist uh, Lithuanian historian, in Lithuania, like almost elsewhere in the former Russian Empire, after the October Revolution, workers generally inclined to social radicalism. However, they were only a minority in an agrarian society made up largely of peasants. In general, the Bolshevik reliance mostly on workers severely limited their chances of successful mobilization in the borderlands. In the meantime, peasants, the more conservative than workers, lived through their own peasant revolution. For them, the issues of self-government offer understood also in, in, in linguistic and cultural terms, went along with their key social demands. Redistribution of land equally shared by landless peasants and smallholders that constituted the majority of peasantry in Lithuania. At least initially, this was more important for them than national self-determination. Nevertheless, in Lithuania, like in Latvia or Estonia, nationalism in the longer run proved more successful because, among other reasons, it became reinforced by class divisions. The old hostility between Polish-speaking landlords and Lithuanian peasants was fertile grounds for radical social and nationalist demands in the post-war period. However, the Lithuanian national government adopted some ideas of social justice more successfully than the local Bolshevik regime. If both sides offered self-determination, even if the Bolshevik offer came with strings attached to, the, to Soviet Russia, only the nationalists were willing to distribute the land to peasants. Meanwhile, in the Commonwealth, National solidarity and unity took precedence over the curse of the class struggle. A radical confiscation of estates and distribution uh, and their distribution to the people would not have solved the hunger of land. It was just not enough land, too many people. It would have created numerous dwarf peasant farms that would not have been able to feed either themselves or the nation. Only industrialization and modernization would help the village. The Polish elites understood that, in particular the conservative and national elites. Therefore, the landed nobility was left alone to a large extent, extent, although there was a limited land reform undertaken. 
the state, the Polish state, confiscated mainly the estates of the partitioning powers, Russian, Prussian, and Austrian. Although uh, the lands of the Polish nobles were also truncated. Fortunately, it was not to the extent uh, both to the owners and the economy. It was not to such an extent like in the Baltic, the Baltic states where the uh, where the land reform was pretty vicious, but that didn't even compare to the robberies undertaken in Soviet Russia, wholesale confiscation. The lack of extreme radicalism meant that Poland rather quickly achieved stability as a parliamentary democracy. It was thanks to the moderation that Polish economy restarted, in particular, uh, the defense industry, which was the key to meet the invading Bolsheviks. Despite all this, social radicalism, radicalism of most of the successor states in the intermarium interfered in the anti-Bolshevik cooperation with Poland, which was much less radical than its newly free neighbors. Another important factor which militiated against uniting of the nations of the intermarium against communism uh, referred to leftist sympathies of some of the most important players there. For instance, Marshal Józef Piłsudski was a nationalist socialist. He considered the white Russians, uh, along with their slogan to restore autocracy and one and indivisible Russia to be a greater threat to Poland than that of the Reds and their utopian promises of a socialist paradise on earth. Piłsudski preferred similar to himself, a leftist Russian nationalist or Ukrainian nationalist, including uh, socialist revolutionaries over the monarchists or conservatives. In the, in the critical period of 1919, it was Piłsudski who decided to maintain neutrality in the Russian Civil War, which was a gift to Lenin. Moreover, the Polish commander-in-chief preferred a federalist solution. However, the successor states of the Russian Empire were formed on an ethno-nationalist basis. Therefore, Lithuania in particular, but also others, rejected the Polish Federalist project. They were dreaming about a socialist and nationalist autarky and not federalism. The newly created ethno folk ethno-nationalist states refused to acknowledge that they refused to acknowledge that federalism was to Piłsudski not a goal in itself, but rather a tool in his grand design of destroying Russia as a multinational empire so as to ensure Poland's long-term survival. This would have also guaranteed the survival of Lithuania and other states of the region, which he envisioned to be optimally federalized with the Commonwealth. Unfortunately, 
the Lithuanians, the Ukrainians, and the others could only see in this Piłsudski scheme an alleged Polish imperialism. Therefore, they attempted to counter it with their own imperialism, maximalism, and chauvinism. Uh, <clears throat> according to a witness and participant in those events, Michal Pavlikovsky, the First World War and emergent from it in congruence with the slogan of self-determination of nations, post-Versailles states, introduce a certain revolution to this seemingly innocent terminology. An ethnically Lithuanian state emerges with a de facto capital of Kaunas, but it considered, considers Vilna as its historically determined capital. The Lithuanian state, which even if it in its Kaunas borders, the Lithuanian element did not predominate, aspires to the borders of Duke Gedimi from the 13th century, endeavoring to erase 500 years of the union of Krevo. It reaches out to Vilnos, Valki, Finciane, Braslav, Grodmo, Osmiano, and Mołodeczno, a maximalist program. The struggles between the inheritors of the uh, old Commonwealth of the first Rzeczpospolita and folk ethno-nationalists uh, played into the hands, first of all, Bolshevik Russia. Other factors which prevented the destruction of communism consisted of a poorly conceived realpolitik. For instance, already in 1919, the Estonians falsely convinced themselves that after ejecting the Bolsheviks from their country, the Reds would leave them alone. Therefore, after a while, they decided to maintain neutrality instead of helping other anti-communists. They even signed an appropriate treaty with Lenin. The Lithuanians, in their ignorance, contrived that the communist assistance against the Poles would be to the benefit of the Lithuanian national cause and will allow them to maintain independence from Moscow. In this way, in a similar vein, some Ukrainian nationalists joined the Reds to fight against the Poles and the Whites. Russian monarchists and other counter revolutionaries refused an unequivocal recognition of the independence of the nations emancipating themselves from the Russian Empire. Thus, they stoked the fire of paranoia and fear as far as the future Russia was concerned. Some whites, in a suicidal manner, supported the, the Reds during the Polish offensive eastwards in 1920. And that included General Brusilo himself, who emerged from hiding and appealed for the defense of Russia. He and others like him naturally fell victim to a Bolshevik provocation because Lenin used the situation on the Polish front as a propaganda tool to mobilize Russian nationalism to benefit Soviet power. In this manner, national egoism, leftist preferences, and imperial predilections triggered a defeat, a catastrophe to the conception of creating an alliance which would have helped 
permanently solidify the independence of the intermarium and anchor it firmly on the idea of solidarity and national cooperation by smashing the Bolshevik power in Russia once and for all. Well, honestly demands to acknowledge at the same time that only the Entente powers had the means to stop, reverse, and destroy the red wave definitively. The initial stage of the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919, as far as that is concerned, was rather encouraging. Despite many problems, the US and France, although also to a lesser extent, Great Britain, supported Poland, in particular by recognizing the Commonwealth as a sovereign state. This had to do not only with for Polish sentiments, but also with the plans, mostly French plans, to use Poland as a barrier against Bolshevism, as the main component part of an anti-Soviet cordon sanitaire. Unfortunately, in practice, the aid by the uh, Western allies or anti-communist forces was inadequate and dishonest. Rather quickly, they ditched white Russia. The only force capable of victorious struggle against communism, Poland, was slowly weakened, criticized, and then ostracized. From the Peace of Brest-Litovsk, at least from the Peace of Brest-Litovsk, the Western powers began abandoning the idea of Polish exceptionalism as a historical nation in the area and the principle of self-determination of nations was also projected onto the non-historical nations led by ethno folk ethno-nationalists. The argument was that all border corrections must take place at the expense of Poland, which was to limit itself to its own ethnic root. In this way, the powers of the West attempted artificially to reduce the Commonwealth to an ethno-nationalist paradigm. At the same time, the powers espoused the complaints and pretensions as far as national minorities were concerned, in particular Germans and Jews, who continued to reside on the so-called ethnic Polish territories. There were demands for guarantees and privileges for them. Simultaneously, the Western powers refused to secure similar guarantees and privileges for ethnic Poles abandoned outside the territories of so-called ethnic Poland. After the cards were dealt this way, the Poles, in particular in the borderlands, were foolishly and absolutely illogically compared to Baltic Germans. The West the allies resolved that the Poles have absolutely no right, no rights in their ancient motherlands, in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, in the Ukraine. 
at Versailles, the Polish delegation was subject to enormous pressure to agree to such parameters. The main proponents of this solution were naturally liberals. During the war against the Bolsheviks in 1920, the principles of liberal Western discrimination of the Poles surfaced in, in the most extreme form. There were diplomatic attempts to sell the Commonwealth to the communists. The British acquitted themselves here in the most dastardly manner, although we can't say too much good about the French. They did not acquit themselves with flying colors at this hour of a deathly lethal crisis for the Poles. However, we must remember that earlier in 1915, and in particular from the end of 1917, France did assist in creating Polish uh, units, the Polish army on its territory, but this was in particularly in the interest of Paris, there was a dramatic need to fill in the gaps on the collapsing front. These widely advertised as pro-Polish French moves at the military level failed to walk congruently with a generous treatment of the main Polish rep political representation in the West, which was essentially ignored. It is true that in October 1918, at the end of the war, the, blue, the Polish Blue Army in France was awarded an official status of a participant in the war. However, the Polish National Committee was never de facto, either de facto or de jure, ruled and recognized as a Polish government. First, its pleas and its presence were treated as an internal matter of Russia. Then consequently, its prestige was undermined. The Allied agreed only to refer to it as an official Polish organization, never a government. In particular, after the, uh, the peace of Brest-Litovsk, Polish politicians in the West were virtually ignored. In the summer of 1918, however, the West recognized a puny and tiny Czech committee as a provisional government with all the privileges accrued. The only exception from this horrible reality among Western allies was the attitude of the United States. Already in June 1917, Washington DC decided to create on its territory a provisional Polish government in exile. The Americans undertook some steps to achieve this goal. Unfortunately, the initiative was almost immediately torpedoed by London and Paris. We must also remember generous help from the United States and Canada, which equipped and trained over 20,000 Polish American volunteers to fight for Poland's freedom. Let us add the crazy American pilots from the Protestant elite who joined the struggle for Poland's independence. Further, the American charitable mission headed by fabulous Herbert Hoover fed, clothed, and nursed millions of Polish citizens at the time of utmost famine and epidemics. 
in this sense, the American humanitarian intervention was indispensable and crucial for the Polish cause. Unfortunately, after 1918, the United States withdrew from the international scene. American diplomatic assistance was suspended, yet they were, uh, yet this was crucial during the Great War and right after, thanks to idealistic President Woodrow Wilson. But now America was no more in the game. The rest of the great powers in the main disappointed Poland, either completely not rendering assistance or offering it too late and too little to really make a difference. France did try, but the boycott of the German and Czech trade unions, leftist trade unions, prevented the transfer of, of war material from France to Poland. The Hungarians helped much more because at a critical junction, they generously shared their own ammunition with the Poles. Let us stress, the West did not acquit itself well. It did not make a positive impact. Despite that, as mentioned, the governments of the powers, in particular London, although Paris too, endeavored to become architects of a diplomatic capitulation, capitulation of Warsaw before Moscow in the most dangerous moment of Lenin's offensive West in the summer of 1920. This was appeasement as its worst, at its worst. The Poles defended themselves as far as white Russians, the, uh, France and Great Britain simply ditched them, abandoned them. In this manner, Bolshevik totalitarianism triumphed in most of the lands of the former Russian Empire. It cast a Spenglerian shadow on the bloodied and stunned Europe, a wasteland, as T.S. Eliot so correctly described it, and it impacted adversely the whole world. 